All right, let's begin. So thanks, everybody. I'm Chad from Turner's Warehouse. We're located in Gilbert, Arizona. We're a record power dealer, and we carry the full line of uh, record power USA products, uh, lathes, chucks, tools, and such. And today we are super happy to have Craig with us from the UK. Craig is an expert on all things record power, and he's been kind enough to join us for this next little bit here and answer any questions you might have. He's going to go over the lathe, the features, and some of the, the things that you may or may not know about it. So it's going to be a very cool thing. Craig is in the Record Power studio with us in the UK. And I don't know the city. I'm sorry, Craig. Maybe you could tell us that. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Craig. If anybody has any questions, I'm going to be here to answer and and uh, ask you the questions. But I'm really looking forward to this. Thanks again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, Chad, first of all, thanks for the invite. Looking forward to this, going through the lathe and uh, hopefully helping a few of your customers out with any questions they've got on the, uh, the Coronet Herald. Um, yeah. Answer to your question earlier on, we're actually based in Chesterfield now, where the factory is. Oh, okay. Uh, the original record factory were based in Sheffield. Chesterfield's still got a, a Sheffield postcode, an S43, but uh, it's just on the outskirts of Sheffield. So we've never, we, we've never moved too far away. Mm -hmm. um, and like you say, we've got the, the full range that we want to go through. Today, we're going to concentrate on the, the Herald, uh, but obviously the ones you stock are also the the envoy and the regent, yes. and so on. So this is sort of the sort of starting point with it, and then we move on from them. Um, yeah, like you said, you can come in any time. If there's any questions you want asking, don't mind interrupting. We'll try and cover as many points as we can. The way we've got All this right. lathe set up here now, um, we've got the legs and also the bench feet on here as well. So the legs obviously down to the floor. They go to a a spread uh, that make the, the machine nice and substantial. So basically, with the legs splaying outwards and outwards, the more weight we get on here, the more substantial the machine becomes because sort of we're spraying it out and we're actually making sure everything's stabilised with it. The good point about these legs before we, we move off them is they are hollow tubes, if you like. And Obviously, at that point, we don't know if people are going to be doing sort of heavy work, light work, because that's the good thing about the Herald, is it will sort of cover a multitude of, of jobs and cope with them all well. Now, if you found you were doing the maximum or you were maxing out on this and you wanted to add a little bit of weight to the legs, you can actually, there's holes in the top of the legs themselves and you can add sand or a little bit of shot into the top, which sort of gives them more weight and more stability. So that's just an option that if you need to do it, you can do it. I'm about six foot one, six foot one and a half. I've probably shrunk a little bit the last couple of years. And I find this height very comfortable. What I've done is I've actually put the legs and the bench feet on you. We don't have to do that at all. Uh, but it just gives us the opportunity to show it all off in one rather than sort of showing you how it does work. Um, if you do just want to bench mount this machine, obviously you don't need the legs. The bench feet will do the job and you can screw that straight down to your bench and it still leaves you plenty of room and access underneath for putting the tools down and getting rid of the shavings and everything else. Um, the actual spread of the legs as you're going through, so it is important, and I know we've got a lot of people here with a, maybe a couple of disabilities or whatever it is, the way this is set up, it does allow you to sort of get right in and underneath, especially if you need to be seated a little bit. And it does allow you full access underneath and get in and onto the lathe while you're doing it. So it is a feature that was designed that way for that reason. Um, so once you've got the machine in position, as you can see now, if you're maxed out and you put the headstock right to one end and then the tailstock, obviously, across to the other end, the lathe is actually a 1420, which means you're going to get 14 inch over the bed and 20 inch between centers. So that's what you're going to max out of this. You can, if required, add to that on the length of it by adding the bed extension on. Now, this is 406 millimetre. I've just been talking to Chad just before. I said, are we going to go in millimetres or 
we're going to go in inches on that lot. So you're looking about 16 <laughs> inch that you can add on to this end of the bed, obviously, which gives you a bigger working area. It allows you to do your table legs, or in one case, you can do your banjos and things like that. You can add more than one of these, because if you look at the ends, it's a very clever design. Because what you've got, so there, so the bottom left in my, and the top right are drilled and tapped. So the top left and the bottom right are clearance holes. So what happens when you offer that up to the end of the bed, it gives you a little bit of movement and a little bit of play that's going to allow you to get it bang on so that the tail stop will actually run across nice and smooth. I call it Katie corner from one corner to the other. So what you'll do is you'll put, you get the, the bolts with it, part of the pack. So you'll screw in two from one side, bottom right, top left, and then you'll screw in two from the inside. So the bottom left, top right. That gives you a little bit more clearance. It's a machine face, as you can see across there. And on the other side, it's a nice machine face. So if you're looking to do sort of, not the maximum diameter, but a longer diameter, you can add two of these. I would put one on, no problem. I'd leave the legs as they were. If you put in two on, I would look, be looking for more support on the legs. What I've actually got on the one in the other training room, I've actually put this bed on. And then I've moved the legs from where they are to the end of the bed extension. Because so if you look again underneath, it is machined to allow you to put the legs on. So it gives you that full support again. So it's all the Ray. little things like this. Yeah, fire oh, away. Sorry. Yeah, you were mentioning the legs. Have you have you seen uh, anyone add casters or would you recommend or not recommend adding casters? Well, I can tell you a bit of a story there. I've just, we did the wood turning cruise earlier in, last year now, when you go around the Norwegian fjords and everything. And obviously on the boat, when you're on there, every night when we sort of finish and we lock up, we lock the machines down, we've got to pull some over and get them strapped down ready for the sailing. And I have seen people put the casters on, they were on the boat, uh, but we had it on checker plate and it weren't a problem. There were no, we put a rubber mat on, there was no vibration coming through <laughs> because it is a nicely balanced machine and it allows you to do that. My only downside to it is obviously when you start putting uh, circular feet on, when you're doing that, you're not picking up on a big face. You're only picking up on the diameter. So if there's any unevenness on your flooring, it's going to show up quite dramatically. And then you're going to get the vibration through and it'll show up more as you turn your speed up or turn it down. The, the, as the revolutions go around, you'll probably start to feel a vibration through. So I have seen it. Okay. The way these are designed, they're not designed for the cast for the, the sort of feet or the wheels or anything like that. Uh, and personally, I'd want to stick away from them. Now, I'm not sort of a massive guy, but the good thing about this weight-wise, all these done me a couple of notes with weights and everything else, you're looking about 48 kilos on this one. So a person either end will easily be able to move this along. And like I said, if you can just pick it up, it's it's not an hard one to do. You're not going to be overstraining if you want to move it out of the way. But I can understand that people do want to move it on the feet. I'd be tempted to sort of have a lift rather than have it on the wheels, but it's a fair enough question if you're mobility-wise. I'd give it a try. Just make sure you've got a nice, even, balanced floor when you're doing it. Thank okay. you, Craig. Can't remember what I was talking about before that now, Chad. Uh, the I'm extension. Gonna... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Like I say, it's all machined up, nicely machined, nice machine faces, all drilled and tapped, ready to put on. No more machining required. Gives you the longer work that you can do if required. But now this is one of my favourite bits I like showing people, to be fair. This is the Tommy bar that comes with the kit, and you can see the angle part on it. And what that allows you to do is just loosen the headstock off. There's a lot of other features on this headstock. But if you imagine now we've maxed out and we've got sort of 20 inch between centres, we've got us 14 over. Chad, you do a lot of pens and pen turning. You know what I mean? One of the things I've watched you on many a time. Mm -hmm. Size of the, the actual lathe itself, a lot of people don't always have that facility in the workshop. They've got the bench saw, they've got the bandsaw at the other side, got the yep. extractor, they've got the tools. 
the thing I like about this is once I loosen off, I can take this head stock up, goes to the full, I can take the tail stock up and I can easily fit the pen turning. And what I've done, I'm just sort of maxed out or I've minimized everything. And I've given me the smallest amount of space. If you can see all I'm on now is the actual length of the bed itself. So if you've got this on a bench, you're only looking at sort of 34 inches, we'll call it now. And we've reduced everything down. So we're not taking all that space up that we were when we needed to be. Yeah, that's a great feature that a lot of people like about the Herald. Yeah, yeah. It just, it, space is a big issue. If we could have a little bit more space, you'd probably fill it with more machines, if I'm being honest. But it does help when you're doing this. Now, one of the other features that we've got on this is obviously, and there's a lot of people on again that have sort of, they're uncomfortable standing up for a length of time. If we're doing a bowl, for instance, and we've got the bowl on and we're leaning over, one of the main selling points of this is the swivel head facilitator, where we can go around. So we can swivel head and we can just lock off into position. Now, the advantage of that, you haven't got to come all the way around and come over the end of the bed. What you can do is you can just slightly angle this. The advantage of that, if you just go to the main shot away, now, instead of sort of having to lean over the bed when you're doing your bowl, we've opened the workshop up and we're stood here in front of it now. So all we've done, we can leave the tailstock on. We're not going to bang his arm on the tailstock when we're doing it. The ball is going to be sat there. We've literally, we've opened everything up to a nice sweeping cut when we're doing his bowl. And that's just one feature. That's just the swivel head. We can go around a full 360 on this rotate it all the way around. We can have it wherever we want. And obviously we'll come up with other features with that later on when we show you the reverse and everything where we can take it all the way along the bed. What you did ask me to, to pick up, uh, Chad, was the outrigger, because you get asked a lot about that. So obviously, again, ball work wise, if you did want to take the tail stock off, we can slide it off easily. When you first get this tail stock, on the bottom, on one of the fixings, there's a little socket head cap screw in that hole there. What that does, if you unscrew that out, it allows you to slide that off in one. Whereas if you leave it in, it will stop to save any accidents and obviously the tail stock can't come off. So you can leave that on or take it off to suit. If you take it off, just be aware that the tail stock can slide all the way off. We just push that out of the way. There's two things we can do. We can bring this all the way along right to the end and we can actually turn from this end with the support. If we want to take it back, rotate around a little bit, we can even put the banjo on this side for the, the support if we need it. But all you do is you take the tool rest out. This is an eight inch tool rest. So as an extra, this comes as standard, eight inch across. You can buy it in 5-inch, 10-inch, and 12-inch as the options to go with this machine. But all this does, this is an inch stem. This goes straight in to the banjo itself. We can lock that off, and then we can put the tool rest back in. So that's going to cover the full bowl area when we're doing it. You can see that from overhead, Ollie, I think. You might get a better shot with that. And it opens it all up. Like I say, you can put the banjo on this side if you wish probably give you a little bit more support when you're doing your bowl work, which would be an advantage. But these are all the little options that we're doing. This is one lathe we're talking about here. And we were opening it all up and we've got that many variations, but that's part of the design. If you actually look at the design of this machine, the original design, it's an old coronet design. We used to do years ago, we used to do an old number one, we used to what they called, there were a machine called an RPM L300. I don't know if you've ever seen that, Chad. It was a it was a, a cast iron bed again with a small DML head stock on it that actually swiveled. But we didn't have much other support going on. You could get a little bit of movement on it. But we took it another stage with this one where we've added features to it. One of them is the variable speed. The old RPM L300 was just a, a, a three-speed machine. Um, obviously, we've got the swivel head facilitator, but we've got the supports to go with it. So, accessory-wise, like I said, three other tool rest and the outrigger as well. Yeah. I haven't seen those lathes, so this is like a, a 
updated version or a continuation of the older design? Correct. Yeah. I mean, that's where okay. it all comes from. The old coronet designs, a lot of the features. If you actually look at some old pictures and you look at the shape of this head, okay. this is where that design, that is where that design comes from and where the bearing support comes from and everything else. So it's, it's something that's been going a long, long time and it's been added to over and over. How long has record been making lathes? Well, it, like I say, it was a coronet before that. Uh, yeah. I started with, with uh, record when it became record power in 1989. Okay. Um, I believe coronet before that, it were in a place called Derby, which were about 45 minutes drive away. Uh, and our old MD, Stuart Pickering, he was the original guy from coronet that came up with it. And he was an apprentice there at 16. And he's retired, he's about 75 now. So wow. it, it goes back a long way. They were all uh, coronet, major, minor. They were all elf. They were all layers like that where the tradition of this one comes from. So it's been around a long time. So have we any questions so far before we move on? Uh, one question, and it's actually something I've wondered, is there a recommended vacuum chuck that you know can be used with the Herald? Good question. There's probably a lady on here <laughs> watching this that will tell you the answer. A vacuum chuck ch does fit it. I think the last one I saw was Ruby Claire who's got one. We did the Hamilton show in Canada, and she fitted one on, and I believe she'll probably come on if I get this wrong. I think it's a one-way one that comes on. Obviously, I ain't got an issue myself with vacuum chucks. The only thing I've got to be careful of is obviously they run off the, the air and you've got to have a non-return valve on so you don't lose the pressure and things like that. If you get if you get the electrics going on your, lay, on your lathe or in your workshop and you've mm -hmm. just got that suction going on, no non-returns, it's, it's going to drop off. There's some very good ones about. And if you look at the, the lathe we've got, we've got a small ham, ham wheel in here, which you could fit the bearing in. The pipe will go through. So I have seen them done. Uh, like I said, um, I can put a link onto one or I'll send you a link, Chad, that you can uh, you can use later on. And basically, you cut the width, of, the length of the pipe that goes through there to suit okay. the lathe that you've got. It's not made especially for us, but I know there is one that fits. We don't do one at the moment, but there is some that fits. Uh, but okay. yeah, um, going on to the headstock, one of the most important features about this is the actual controls and the working of it. What we've got, it's a three-step puller inside here, as you can see there. If I just rotate that round a little bit, you'll probably see it a little bit better. Is that a better view for everybody? There you go. Looks good. So I've got it on the middle speed at the moment. So on the middle speed, the ratio, we go from 140 RPM right up to 1,868. You're going to be on that middle puller majority of the time with the work that you're doing. Obviously, if you start talking about pens and the fine stuff, you want to go faster. So what you do, you jump up to the next pulley along. If you went up to pulley number three, the maximum RPM jumps up to 3,890 and all the way down to 290. If you took it to the lowest one, so if you're doing your heavy work, your bolds and things like that, which is pulley one, starts off at 95 and goes all the way up, to 1,055. I've got that written down in front of me, Chad. I don't know that off the top of my head. <laughs> but the advantage of that is you're always going to be at the right periphery speed because obviously torque's a big issue. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said a lot of the time you're going to be on the middle puller because that's going to cope with a multitude of jobs that you're doing. But when you do need it, it's like being in the right gear in the car. You don't want to be revving on the top end trying to get to the top speed in the first gear when you can jump to your second and it'll be cruising. If I have that running now, I'll turn that to uh, pulley number two and we'll show you the electrics in a bit. If I switch it on and it starts running at 1,400, you can... I'll be quiet a minute. See how quiet it is. And then we can control and take that up and down to the desired speed. It's not picking up the speed very well on the, the camera but we'll show you that in a little while and get it to the speed you want. But my point is, or what I'm trying to get across to you is, have a look at what job you're doing. Have a look at the speeds or the size of wood that you're going to be doing. You can pick the correct puller. 
you're not putting strain on the motor. And the advantage is the higher the speed you can do for your pens and things like that, the, the lower the torque is. The Obviously, the lower the speeds, when we go up to the, the smaller pulley there, the lower the torque is, the slower the speed, but the higher the torque. So you're basically not going to be stopping the wood. It's going to drive through it every time. It's going to You're going to enjoy turning rather than having to fight against it when you're doing it. While we're in there, you can also see the indexing while we've got a good picture in there. And what it is on the front, the plunger, you just rotate it around. And there's 24 segments on there. And at the front of the um, headstock, there's a viewing. If the lid's shut and you can't see inside, there's a viewing uh, all in there that you can have a look, 1 to 24. There's probably going to be some questions on indexing. Basically, I like to tell everybody, if you're looking to, to do a clock with 12 uh, segments in there, so you'd have your, your wood on there, you want 12 different positions evenly spaced around you'd turn that every two lock it back in mark off ready for drilling and you'll get your 12 even uh, segments as you're going around and obviously you can take it a lot further with that type of work so yeah that, that built-in way... system is really nice i used to have to use the uh external the one that disc. mounted yeah, yeah, so when i yeah. first started using the herald that window was a huge game changer yeah Great stuff. Nice. Well, like I said, while we have got that there, just to show you how easy it is to let me tell oh, yeah. the camera right here. Just to show you how easy it is to actually change the belt. All we do is we loosen off on the handle there. We bring the motor towards us. That slackens the belt off. And then we can move across from one side to the other. And just roll that round. The thing about it, this is a poly V drive belt. So it's a drive belt with multitude of Vs on. Because before, when things started, you used to have V belts. And then you had flat belts. And this is a better combination of both because you've got the width of the belt, which is giving you the actual reduction in vibration. And then you've got the Vs, which is giving you the grip as well. So you just make sure they're lined up correctly in the corresponding Vs on the pulley. Rotate it round by hand to make sure it's really nice and smooth. You just want about quarter inch, six millimetre, and it literally is the weight of the motor. Don't push the motor down and try and stretch it. Just let the weight of the motor do the job and lock off. And what you'll find is that just gives you the correct tension on there for the drive as it's going through. And then you're away. I'll put it back onto the... The middle speed, I usually leave it on that once. It's the most common speed I use on. If you're doing sort of spindle work, two-inch spindles, or starting off on a, a bowl and just roughing out, it's a nice sort of belt or speed to be at. Again, just the weight of the motor. Make sure it's sitting in the Vs nicely. When you're doing that, lock off as you go down. Rotate around and you're ready to go. We can secure that up, turn it up, and it's nice and secure. Craig? Someone asked if you could tell us the difference between a DVR motor and a variable speed motor. Well, the DVR, when you're looking at the DVR that they've got, you, are you talking about the Nova one when you're looking at that? There's a direct drive with no belts at all. They didn't specify. I, didn't, I don't know if I, I didn't understand the question completely. Yeah. I mean, this has still got belt drive on it. The DVR that Nova do is obviously technology-wise, they're up there, if you know what I mean. But this is a, a, a output 0.75 kilowatt with a one uh, kilowatt input for the drive, and it's more than adequate for the type, size of work that we're doing on here. When you're looking at the DVR, that, that's a no uh, belt. It's a direct drive through the motor. Obviously, there's a big difference in price when you're pricing one of them up as well. Um, but... Yeah, that is the main difference. There's no belts on theirs when you're doing that. We're driving off the motor onto the pulley. The pulleys are doing the work to give you the torque. You're getting the correct torque, so that it never puts the motor under strain if you, you do it that way. Like I said, we lock that down. If I just spin this round now, what you can see is the, the electrics of it on there. And what you'll see is we've got the emergency stop on the top. We've got the switch, the power switch, 
the on and off power switch. This, if you ever have a problem or you get the trip out in your workshop and things like that, it'll trip the machine out. You just have to press this button to reset it. But when you look at the front there, what you've got is the on and the off. And then you've got belt ratio, reverse. And then that one there is obviously the speed control, the variable speed. So when you're operating this, obviously you make sure your indexing is not stuck in or anything like that. At the moment, we've got it on the middle belt. So the light there, I don't know if it's picking up, there'll be a one, two, and three marker. We've got it on the middle belt. So I can move it to one, two, and three. I know it's on the second one, so I put the light on the second one, which is the middle one. Then I can just turn it on. And obviously, the machine starts turning. I can adjust the speed up or down. You can see the, the actual figures. We're faster and slower. And then we can turn that off. Whatever speed we turn it off at, in this case, 1,328, when I put the machine back on, it's going to come, it's going to wind up back to that speed. That'll remain the same. We don't have to reset it again. And it'll apply that to whatever speed we're on. So if we just turn it back on, slow start, picks it back up, let it get up to the 1,328, then we turn it off. Right. If we want to go in reverse. Yeah, I was going to say one of my favorite things is that you can set the speed before you start it. That, right. that was a real that's nice. Exactly, that's exactly what it is. I mean, I like to tweak a little bit. Once I've got the wood on, you're going around. What you'll find is, and you'll probably find it the same on the bigger stuff, especially, you'll find a speed and there'll be, you might get a little bit of vibration through it, through the wood. The advantage of this with uh, variable speed rather than coming down sometimes and slowing the speed up, you'll just go five, 10 maximum RPM more and you'll lose that vibration because the periphery speed and everything else and the wood will balance itself as you're going through. So I love that side. And then once you've got that balance, like you said, you turn it off, you can turn it back on, we're back to the same speed again. The reverse button is this one here. But what you've got to remember, when we go in reverse, all the threads are going to try and unscrew. So that's why the safety side of things, you'll see any accessory that's provided by record, you'll have a grub screw on there that allows you to lock the accessory off. So in this case, this is the um, the actual thread protector that doubles up as a, a small face plate. If you took a chuck, for instance, on here, what you'll see on the chuck, on the outside there, Again, you'll see the, the screw. And what you get with the chuck and the accessories is a little leather washer. If you go over red, little leather, red leather washer there and the and the socket, head, sorry, the grub screw as we call it. And what that does, that stops any marks going onto the, the shaft of the spindle or the thread when you tighten it down. That's just to make it safe for turning in reverse so nothing flies off and it's you. But all you have to do to go in reverse on the Herald is you press and hold the reverse, the, the light flashes at you, and I don't know if you heard the beep. The beep tells you it's now in reverse mode, and you can see the red light that's highlighted. That's telling you we're in reverse. We can now turn on. It'll go in reverse. When we turn off, and this is the safety aspect, when we turn off, you'll see the red light goes off. So now when it comes to a stop, if we were to start up again, it will go back to forward. That's the safety aspect. So basically, you can't go in reverse accidentally. You have to press the reverse button, it registers it, goes in reverse. When you turn it off, it'll go back to the forward mode, so you've got to press the reverse again to go back in. Just a safety aspect. I like that idea about it. You're going to have no trouble. Craig, a couple of questions. Um, one was a comment. People really enjoy the, the movable power box on the, the uh, Regent and the Envoy. Do you think yeah. down the road that could ever be a thing on the Herald? We added. I mean, obviously, things are improving all the time. Yeah. The way the motor were designed and everything else, we're trying to make this compact like a, like a MIDI lathe, if you know what I mean. And that was the reason behind it. The advantage we've got, and I know we talked about this earlier, Chad, the advantage you've got is we have got the facility to put the magnet switch on it. 
which we can put anywhere on the leg. It's always there. We can knee that and make sure it's a safety aspect because what your customer's saying is basically if we're turning, we're in the mode and we've got quite a big job on there, a big bowl on there. Obviously, you're going around that to get to the controls. Uh, but that's the advantage of having this sort of swivel head. You're always still in control. If we can't get to the controls because we've gone too big, we've got the facility of this uh, emergency stop that you can see there that we've got in position and everything's under control and we can stop it on that. And that will actually stop it a little bit quicker than the standard stop as well. Okay. Only a second uh, or so. But it does another well. question, and I think Ruby was answering it in the chat, is why does it start slowly? Um, well, that, that can be adjusted over time. That was our preference. Mm -hmm. That was our preference. And the reason with it, as it starts up, obviously the weight of the wood, if you've gone there and you've, you've sort of tweaked it and you've put another piece of wood on, like you said, Chad, and you've got it set at 1600, it gives you a bit of reaction time as well because you can realise, oh, I'm a bit fast here, let's turn down. If it just fired up straight away as you're doing it, obviously safety is a big issue with us. We want to keep safety in mind. So the startup's done. We could probably have it starting up a lot faster. We could probably have it stopping a lot faster. The stopping faster method, again, is because if you've just got it in the standard forward and you've got a lot of weight on there and you've not locked the spindle off or you've not locked the chuck off and you stop it and it stops too fast, everything's going to try and unwind itself. So this is the happy medium that we've come up with, which we th think suits I won't say everybody, you've got professional turners like Ruby that obviously know a lot what they're doing and things like that. But it suits the type of customer base that, that we're on. Like yourself, you know what you're doing, Chad, and you know what how to react to the lathe. When you're first taking it up as an hobby, you've got a lot to learn. And this speed ratio that we've got does suit a multitude of people. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of people have commented since you were talking about reverse about the uh, video that's out there showing the, <laughs> the two button to keep it in reverse. Do you I recommend you, doing I that? You were gonna, no? I knew you were going to mention it. I try not to. It can be done. No doubt. I wasn't going <laughs> to. Yeah, it can be done. I ain't got a problem with it. People have just got to realize that it's them that's doing it. It can be overrode, and, and you press the two buttons, basically. It'll keep it in reverse, so it stops you having to go back. Um, yeah, it can be done. But... Again, we're looking to instruct people more to the beginners when we're showing things off and we don't want them to get confused. That's the yeah. reason why. I think from our standpoint here, we would recommend not doing that, but you know, yeah. we can't yeah. control what everyone does. No, um, no. One other no. thing, you mentioned those little... I've got my safety, I've got my safety glasses on today, Chad. You can't yeah, you've got them on, you're not even turning. <laughs> yeah, you can't. I can't see any other ones, that's why. But... Uh, it's yeah. just little things like that. You 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 wear your clothes, your coats you wear, stopping the cuffs getting into there. There's a lot of safety things. We wouldn't be able to design a lathe if we did certain things with it. Once the customer's got it, there's a lot they can do with it to adapt to suit the cells that don't always suit everybody. Okay. Are we moving on? Any more questions? I think you muted yourself, Chad. I muted myself. Uh, yeah, that was great. Thank you for that. That's very yeah. informational. Right. Moving on, what we've got in America, as you know, you're inch and a quarter eight. Because we're over here, we're uh, M33, but it's the same scenario. We've still got a number two most taper thread in there. It does come with, again, if you overhead, Ollie, uh, it does come with the the handle, which serves as a dual purpose. And again, if you're, if you're turning and you're locking things up and you want to get things stable when you're doing that, a lot of people will use the indexing to lock the spindle when they take the, the chucks on and off. But obviously it's not ideal because at some point you're going to damage the indexing marks on there. What the best way of doing, if you actually turn the spindle and drop this handle through, it goes through the handle and it locks on the bar at the bottom and it actually stops the spindle turning and makes it nice and secure. Again, that might not be the best picture to show you. I'll try and bring it round. If you come to the front, Ollie, does it show you better? That side camera. So we go through the handle with the Tommy bar and we go down and behind 
the stem there, which is the one that allows you to reverse it, then it stops the spindle moving at all, makes everything nice and secure. You're not going to damage the indexing. Just remember to take it out before we start up. We'll take that back round. So we've got the hand wheel, inch and a quarter eight thread, indexing, the viewing point for your indexing. We talked about the inch stem before with the eight inch um, tool rest. Then we come to the tail stop. Again, number two most taper. As we turn that, self-ejecting tail stop to take the revolving centers out. Keep that nice and clean. When you print it back in, you don't want that to be marked. And a nice action that you've got with the indexing and the marks for the distance you're going to drill or press in on the side of the column there. You've got the lock for locking the spindle off. And this is a ratchet handle, so we can turn and lock that in, and then we can actually put the ratchet handle in the correct, in the position we require for ease of use when we're doing that. We showed you the underside earlier um, on the tailstock. And again, if you put the bed extension on, it's a nice slide across to make it nice and secure when you're doing that. You can see the easy action. What I would say, and what I use quite a lot, that you'll probably use, I just use a bit of a what I call a scratch pad that you'll probably use for sanding and things like that. I use a bit of, we call it geyser over here. You can use a bit of WD-40 and things like that. And I just like to keep these beds nice and clean <clears throat> so that you do get that sliding action. And then underneath here as well, where it's machined underneath, if you're turning and you're putting your finishes and your polishes on, over time your resins are going to get built up. Just make sure they're kept nice and clean and you will get that nice sliding action when you're doing it that does feel nice when you would turn in, when you're doing that. So keep that maintenance free. Again, silicon spray can be used on the bed that will help the dust slide off it. I've seen other people use the wax. I have used silicon spray on this one in the past just to keep it nice and smooth as you're doing that. Okay. Any questions on the tailstock, Chas? Oh, on the bed, is there anything you don't want to use? Like you mentioned, silicone spray is good. Is there anything to avoid? Well, uh, silicone spray, the only thing with silicone spray, if you put your timbers down and things like that, it sometimes can blemish your timbers. Mm -hmm. So a natural wax is quite good. I mean, I do use WD-40, and then I use the uh, the scratch pad, clean it all down, then I wipe it all off. A little bit of white spray to get rid of everything. And then, like okay. I said, just a, a bit of natural wax does the job a lot of the time and just helps it and protects it when you're dropping your finishes on there. Is it good to use WD-40 or a lubricant on the tailstock itself? Um, I do. I mean, WD-40 is like a dry lubricant. When you put it on, it will stop. So it's advisable to get some sort of lubricant because inside here, obviously on the tailstock, you can't see them. And the older, the older tailstocks had the thread coming out. And obviously this were a redesign for it with the keeper plate. But inside there, there is a lot of action going on with the uh, the tailstock and the thread. And you do get, over time, you will get a bit of a muck in there and things like that. So it's nice to take it off now and again. I can quickly show you that. What we like for time, Chad? Are we all right? Yeah, we're great. If you don't mind, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, what you can do is, there's a, on the tailstock itself, there's a little bit of an old. So I think you may will call this a little bit of maintenance on the tailstock. There's an old on the main hand wheel of the of the tailstock, we can go in there with a, the Allen key, which comes with a kit, and we can just loosen that off until you'll find this keeper plate comes out, and it has done. That's nice. Must have done a good job cleaning this one. So then that is your you want to go above. Ollie. That's your that's your keeper plate. And then what I'd do with that one over time, I'd just again little bit of fine Henry cloth or even this scratch pad and just make sure there's no burrs on there or anything else like that. If you did want to take the the puppet barrel, as I call it, out, is that a term that's used? We call it a puppet barrel. So what you can do, you can undo the grub screw there. And if you look at the, the actual tailstock itself, it's got a... Can you see the keyway there? 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yep. So that's what this grub screw runs in. So this grub screw can be over tight. And if it gets over tight, because some people tell to lock that up, to lock it in place. And then they forget to unlock it when they, they're moving it in and out. So you get a little bit of burr on the actual keyway. Is that something you'd recommend checking if you're feeling any only kind if of you have tension? a problem, Chad. Only if you have a problem. Yeah. I mean, it, it's going to run nice and smooth a big percentage of the time. But what you want to do is just make sure and run your finger along there and make sure you've not over tightened that and made this burr. Because you imagine if you made a burr, every time you're going to be winding it, you're going to feel that burr as you're going along, and it's not going to be a nice smooth operation. And then just check the thread, and like you said, a little bit of. WD on there, there's a dry lubricant, even a little bit of grease won't do it no harm. So make sure this is rotating. Then we can slide that back in, make sure that the, the keyway is in the right position. <laughs> do the same thing on the record, Envoy. I'll find it. Yes, we'll try to do it. And then you'll feel that bottom out and then just come back quarter a turn. And then you should be able to slide it without feeling any burr. Then we okay. can go back in with the hand wheel as you go in, drop the keeper plate back in. And again, as you drop that in, just make sure you feel it and you don't feel any burrs as you rotated it before we then lock off with the smaller Allen key. Again, don't over tighten that. Just make sure it nips the keyway in place. And then you're going to have a nice smooth tail stop when you're going along. Craig, a couple yeah. of questions. Um, in the manual, it says white spirits. Do you know, is that denatured alcohol in America? Yeah. Or mineral yeah. spirits, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. Uh, someone asked, they said they have a five year old Harold um, with the older tail stock. Could they get a new tail stock to replace it? Would it fit? Yeah. Yes. Okay. 100%. Cool. Okay. Then we come back. Just checking I've left everything in place. You get a standard with this. You get the four prong driver standard. You get the face plate, which acts as a thread protector, which you can put the balls on as well. And you get a revolving center with that as well for the, the tailstock end. And like I said earlier, with the uh, the tool rest, it's an 18 inch tool rest that goes in there. If you were to put the chuck on, this is the SC4 chuck that we've got. In our instance, it's an M33. If you went to America, obviously it's an inch and a quarter eight and that'll just screw straight on nicely you can see there the the hole if you want to be doing reverse turning where you can lock off with the grub screw i'm just making sure the head's locked in place i have done that before chad to be honest i've, I've rotated it around put it back to center it all centers upright just make sure you lock off because if you put went between centers you haven't locked it down it's going to gradually inch the, the headstock along. So just make sure it's nice and secure on there. And then if you're doing a bowl, for instance, on this one, part of the SC4 chuck, you would get the small face plate with the dovetail insert. You get the 50 mil jaws with the SC4, and that would attach straight onto there and open up. You want to go above with that, uh, Ollie? Put the chip key down somewhere now. Is there a 50 hertz version available? No, so you can <clears throat> you can see you've got the I'll ask him. I don't face know plate answer. ring as standard. So you get the face plate ring, the 50 mil jaw, you get the wood screw and all the screws to go with it. You can slide that up. Again, right to tight and left to loosen. You're ready to go with your bowl. I did talk earlier, Chad, about the range of chucks that we do. Uh, yeah. Again, we can, we can jump back to the uh, the lathe any time, but I'll just quickly show you this. I'll take this to the, the shows and exhibitions. I think Ollie's going to have to swivel the camera around a little bit. 
You're going to see uh, while, why. while he does oh, that. Yeah. The, the SC three and the SC four are very similar in size. What would you recommend for somebody for like a first chuck? Oh, uh, the SC, I mean, all it is, it's, it's the weight of it as well. And if you look at the SC three and SC four, the SC three is this one here with an open back and the thread. And then with that, you do get the face plate ring, you do get the 50 mil jaws, you get the wood screw and all the screws to go with it, and it's a lighter chuck. But what I will tell you on this, Chad, is the, the actual uh, slides, the scroll ring, and the uh, they're all made out of, obviously, cast iron or sintered iron when they're doing it, but they're the same ones you get on the SC4. So if I, put, if I take this SC4 back off, you put them side by side obviously this looks an heavier this looks obviously a slightly bigger chuck there's not a lot in size you've on size wise obviously you've just got another half an inch either side to on the size but you get the same kit with the face plate ring the 50 jaws and everything else mm -hmm. it's a slightly heavier chuck but it's a sealed chuck on the back and it has got the indexing around it as well Easily stripped out and maintained, both as accurate as each other. Obviously, price for price, SC3 is a sort of better deal, if you know what I mean, on price because it's slightly cheaper, but you still get the quality. What I would say is what lathe you're putting it on because one is a little bit heavier as well than the other. If you're buying the SC4, obviously that's be one that you move along with. A lot of people buy a pair. They might even put the cold jaws on this one and keep them on, or the pen jaws and keep them on, and then use the other chuck to sort of swap the jaws about as and when it's required. Um, but if you're starting off, I'll be honest with you, an SC3 would suit most people to start off with, then move after that. But what I was saying about the jaw slides and the scroll ring that go in there, all that sort of side of it is all the same quality and same sizing as the SC4. It's just mm -hmm. a different body. And then all you've got extra is, like I said, because it's sealed, the pinions on the SC4 are the sintered cast as well. So all the moving parts are sintered cast because they're not they're going to last a lot longer with wear and tear, and you're going to retain the accuracy when you're doing that. So what I've got there is the SC4, the SC3, got the SC2 and SC1. You can see the full range of jaws for the SC1 and 2 here, which is the, um, the pen jaws, the, uh, the dome jaws, which are a good one, the face plate and the spigot jaws on there. So the full range of, of five jaws that you've got. We've got about 16 different jaws for the SC3 and SC4. Uh, so we've got that more or less covered, to be fair. Mm -hmm. And then underneath that, underneath that on my drawer, I've got the full range of sensors as well on there because... I know there's one you like particularly. We talked about it earlier. We've got the uh, the revolving centre kit. And with the inserts, you can see the inserts at the back here. And the one that I would imagine interests you more than anything is the pen mandrel one. And you can see the O-ring there. That makes it a lovely, I don't know if you heard that pop, fit. And then the, uh, the Tommy bar to knock it out, obviously, when you're taking that out. You can put, I like this one, if you're doing fine work, it's a revolving centre, but it allows you to get in behind, allows you to get in there behind the centre. Gives you a lot more access than a standard centre. But this is the kit, we call it, it's a 103910 kit, which is a revolving centre kit with the four centres, the revolving centre itself and a knockout bar that comes in a nice package. Yeah, that, that kit yeah. has probably been my favorite new tool uh, in a while because it's so versatile with all the different centers and it's yeah. so precise. But the advantage we've got with that one as well, Chad, is like further down the line now, obviously you can see here you've got the the, the uh, multi-tool center. Mm -hmm. now further down the line, at some point, if we feel that we need a bigger one of those for heavier work because we're producing that in-house, obviously that can be done at some point. And that's where, such as yourself, when we talk to you and we sort of mention what your your requirements are and what, what you need to do your projects, 
we've now got things like that in place where we can add to the range as and when we require. Well, and yeah, and not to toot records horn here, but like you guys are responsive to like the needs and making stuff that works like that. So I think that's a direct result of like people who actually use the stuff, you know, yeah. making the stuff. So it's a really that's cool. Right. Thing. Yep. That's right. Um, Craig, back to the lathe. We did have a question and I don't, I'm not a, a technical guy, so I don't know what this really means, but is there a 50 Hertz motor available or I don't I don't really know what that means. I just wanted to ask it for the, the viewer. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent on the Hertz ratings. Yeah, if you drop me an email on it, I know you've got 50 and 60 Hertz uh, yeah. on them. I thought the 50 Hertz one, there's some that goes on ships and things like that for the, the Hertz. So obviously you're 110 volt with this as well, which is different. But if you, your customer, what would you say mm -hmm. the guy was? What was his name? Uh, he, he just asked if there was a 50 Hertz available and I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, if you just, uh, Get the email and send me that over, Chad. I'll I'll give okay. you the full. Uh, I'll get you the correct answer to that one uh, independently, so I can tell you exactly what we've got and what's available. Okay. Um, another question I get a lot on the Herald is is kind of the the old standard for every lathe is what's the biggest bowl I can turn? <laughs> right. You know, obviously, Mike, who comes to see you, we. He took me over to one of the shows years ago when we were first launching these. And uh, obviously in America, they want to do as, as big as they can, as quick as they can with that size in which I get. And we've got 14 inch over the, the bed here. If we use the swivel head and we spin round, the biggest I've done on this one was a 23 inch platter. And it coped admirably. You went to problem. But this is where... What happens if you turn around to me and said, I want to be doing that size on a regular basis, I probably want to sell you the envoy to start off with. So you'll get away with it as a one-off and it'll get you up and running and get you to feel. And the motor and the pulleys are up to it. It's just that you get into the size where the work's bigger than what you've got and it starts to look uncomfortable even though it's coping with it. So if yeah. you're starting to do bigger than sort of 22 I would look at sort of maybe looking at getting the envoy, even the regent at that, that stage when you're doing that. We say, yeah, we think... say catalog 21 inch. Mm -hmm. That's what we state as a max. I have done a little bit bigger for testing and it did cope with it, but at what point do we try and break it, if that makes sense? Well, I think that's where it's good to visit a dealer or somebody who's turning on a regular basis to kind of help you get the right size. Yeah. You know, You'll get that that's the first one. That's what I always ask people is, you know, what do you want to make the most of? And, you know, yeah. that way they can get the right size because the Herald is probably great for so many people. But if they only want to turn big stuff, you're totally right. Yeah. See, the thing is, we've, we've tried to adapt with this and we've tried to sort of put in here a lot of different design features and people have worked hard on it. Um, I mean, Jeremy and our technical that does a lot of the advancements if we're going to change things over or we're going to bring another product out and things like that. It's not all standstill. You're working on it all the time to try and improve things. And when they looked at designing this and bringing it through, we actually went over and did a lot of testing uh, in the factory um, with the actual turning of it. And we did the bigger sizes that you're talking about. And we did try to sort of get to the stage where we were going to break it if we went any bigger. And it got a bit scary. And that's why we put a 21 inch specification on there for the biggest. You'll get a little bit more, but after that, just just have a look at yourself when you're doing that safety wise and and be more make sure it's comfortable what you're doing. That would be my advice. Yeah, I think that's that's great advice. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, and you know, the the Herald's on sale right now. If anyone watching is curious about price, yeah. um, they're $9.99 here in the US, and that's a pretty for what you're getting, you really can't touch it with anything else uh, quality-wise. So we're really thankful for obviously, that. Obviously, I know there's a lot of people from Europe on at the moment, <laughs> and there's obviously in the UK, and I heard you say somebody's in from uh, Belfast um, mm -hmm. over there. And there is obviously European deals on, obviously similar to yours. At the moment, that ends, or looking at ending, sort of the end of February, then will be reviewed. Uh, but, yeah, they're very similar to what you're looking at. Uh, so basically, 
look at your nearest dealer um, to try and find them in Europe as well. Yeah, and we've uh, converted our classroom to all heralds. So uh, anyone who comes here for classes, they turn pens on heralds, they turn bowls on heralds, they do everything on the herald. So it's it's a great all around machine. Um, I will say if anyone has a question, definitely put it in the chat or let us know. Uh, somebody did ask, do you know offhand the height of the spindle with the yeah. legs without the bench feet? I do, actually. <laughs> I <laughs> figured you might. Well, if you if you did it as it is right now, as we've got it now, um, so from the floor with the legs and the bench feet, we're looking at 44 and a half inch, which is 1,130. I did remember that. The, your bench feet are 60 millimeter. Um, so obviously you're just going to take that off. So you're looking at 1,000 and uh, 1,070. There you go. Without the bench feet on That's just the legs. Perfect. That's to the center. Okay. Um, I always Excellent. try and work on just below I elbow height. I'm comfortable with, if you know what I mean, when I'm turning. Uh, because what you don't want to be doing, you don't okay. want to be on your... You've probably all seen our um, sort of live shows that my course and that, and we have Amy, uh, Emma on the Tiny Turner. And and sometimes the, her technique comes in from a lot lower. Not... She's only small, but she does come in from lower as well. But everybody, that's what I try and get across. Everybody's got a, a position that they're comfortable in. Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, when you go reverse turning or everything else that you're doing, just make yourself comfortable. It might be you're going to put yourself on a duck board to be slightly higher. It might be that obviously you want to put the bench feet on the, the bench and then bring that up. Just make yourself in a comfortable position so you're not sort of aunching over it, but at the same time, you're not having to squat to get comfortable. Your arms and your body want to be nice and relaxed with your legs mm -hmm. sort of spread basically across. So we're comfortable and you've got chance to move across with the tool. You're not sort of stretching with your arms when you're doing it. Okay. Um, someone asked a question if they were available in New Zealand, but I just saw that Mike answered it, that they're looking for a new dealer. So uh, you can get in touch with Mike if you're in New Zealand. Uh, somebody asked, what kind of maintenance should they be doing on their banjo? All I do, if I'm being totally honest, I've got a little flat belt linisher and I just roll on that every now and again. Not very often. Depends what tools you go in because... The, the easiest thing to do, if you've got round bar tools like ball gouge and things like that, they roll quite easily and you're not going to get a lot of damage. When you start using sort of things with corners on, like skew chisels and things like that, what we do is we break the corners on the turning tools now. So even though they are flat bar, cornered, we actually, when I say break the corners, they're rounded off slightly on the edges. That makes it easier for when you're actually doing the operation. Because if you've got sharp edge tools and you start to dig in, that's when you get the problem. So either a block with a bit of Henry cloth and you can just rub across, make it nice and smooth. I've got a really fine belt on a flat belt initia and I take the I take the tool rest off now and again and I literally just roll it on the linisher. Just one pass and it cleans it up nicely. And again, a little bit, of, little bit of wax on there at the same time doesn't go amiss. Uh, we have a turner who says he's disabled and he's curious about the amount of adjustment on the Envoy. I know we're switching lathes here. I know it has the adjustable feet. Do you happen to know what the adjustment size is or height? Um, off the top of my head. We can get him the answer if, if you don't yeah, know. Yeah, I can, I can send him the yeah. answer. I don't know it off the top of my head, the actual okay. size. I apologize for that. But um, again, send me the email. I'll send you a personal reply in the morning and uh, I'll get you the adjustment on it. Like I say, it has got, with the Envoy and Region, just to explain the Envoy and Region, are actually the same bed, they're the same legs, they're the same adjustment feet. Okay. The differences are the head stocks and the tail stocks. One is obviously 16-inch. One's 18 inch. Um, so the, the height will increase slightly for the height of the uh, the center height, if you like, or the elbow height, as I call it. The feet on the bottom are just about uh, two and a half to three inch. But I'll get you the minimums and maximums. If you drop me an email, I'll send you that off 
and give you an accurate size. Okay. We'll get, get with you on that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It looks like we have a lot of interest in the uh, Envoy and Regent as well. So maybe we're going to have to do this again yeah. with those. Well, it's funny you should say that because we have got a bit of a project coming up, myself and Owe, where we mm -hmm. are going into the, uh, the classroom just to go through the basics like we have today, just through the basics. And then uh, we can show you the centers on. But like you've just said, uh, Chad, if you want to do that one evening on this, then that's fine. They are a bit heavier than a machine to get into the studio, but it's quite doable. Uh, so there's no problem at all. We can, we can get that sorted. Um, yeah, we, we have some people talking about using the, uh, the outrigger or extension on the tool rest. Yeah. And they're getting some movement. Is that just a, a tightening adjustment? Is there anything that can be lubed yeah. to help well, that from moving? Yeah, I mean, all all I do is when you when you take the um, you take the tailstock off, you take the banjo, you take the banjo off. When you come here, there's a, there's a plate here that we've got, and if you look underneath that plate, I don't know if you can see this. Even now, I've got a little bit of dust in there. And there's some there's a there's a pad on this side, the pad on this side. And what if you if you gain a little bit of movement on that, if you cling these pads down, redler, or even just rub over with a little bit of Henry cloth, when it goes back on, and the recesses that are on the on the actual um, base or the casting mate up with them, you'll get a lot more secure. If there's dust or shavings between them, what it does it compresses the dust and the shavings. And then it'll start to ride back up with vibration. So you keep these clean. Just check your pad underneath. Give it a clean down. Just run across it with a bit of Henry cloth. And I can guarantee you it'll make a lot better grip when you're doing it. If you yeah, put I that think... back on, if you put that back on, and I'll put the outrigger on then. Just gonna mess with this. So if you lock that down and it is nice and clean, you come back in with the outrigger. That's an inch. You can lock that up. I'm not being funny, but I'm my fighting weight, and I'm not going to actually move that at all as I'm going up. It's just a matter of keeping it clean and making it secure. I mean, even side to side movement there, you can see. I'm actually yeah. trying to move the lathe when I'm doing it now. Rather I think that's that. probably I'm what not it's saying. It's not happened, but I think that is one of the issues where you get the movement on it. Yeah, and I think some people tend to get their lube down in there or grease that, thinking it'll help, but it actually makes it worse and makes it move. Yeah, just check the pad underneath. Make sure the faces are nice and clean. You've got no resin build up. Clean them off, and I'm sure you'll you'll get more joy with that. I know you said at the beginning uh, the weight in kilograms. I think the Herald weight is about 115 48, pounds. 48 kilograms, yeah. Kilograms, okay. Yeah, so just a little over 120-ish uh, pounds. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, I think that, that banjo question could be, you know, that relates to all lathes. If you get that spongy banjo handle, it mm. just needs that little bit of maintenance. And obviously, when you've done that as well, Chad, sometimes – just a quarter a turn on the note after you've cleaned it up, mm -hmm. it'll give you a different position of your handle to go through. If it's too loose, you can't actually drive through the cam. So it's a case oh. of sort of a bit of a quarter a turn sometimes makes a lot of difference on the note. Very good. Excellent. All right. Anybody have any other questions? Craig is here to answer your questions. We had some great chat today. Craig, just so you know, a lot of people were answering um, questions that were something they could answer in the chat. So that's really helpful. So thanks to everybody who was answering questions. Uh, in regards to what you were just doing with the banjo, does the orientation of the pad underneath matter is a question. Uh-oh. 
I'm not hearing Craig. Are you hearing Craig? Craig, you didn't mute, did you? Let's just hang on one sec. I think he's got a mic thing he's fixing. If you guys have any questions, this is a rare opportunity to get your questions answered straight from the source. So uh, Craig's pretty happy to talk about anything record power, I believe, from what we've seen here. And he's super knowledgeable. So plus, if you're in the U.S., he has a cool accent. So it's not a bad thing, right? <laughs> Battery? <laughs> Yeah, battery problems. Oh, battery? I, I figured you had a mic thing, so we were yeah, we were. It was, uh, it. it was the it was the um, receiver. The batteries are okay. going on the receiver. So yeah, all I was doing when I did, did the banjo there is again just clean the face on the banjo when you're sliding it up and down with the resin and the oils and the finishes that you're using. It'll pick it up, and then all of a sudden you feel like it might be a bit of rocking. Just give it a clean down to make sure it's face on face when you're Perfect. doing it. Yeah. All good. Yeah, the uh, machines run so much better with a little maintenance, so that's always a good right. thing. <laughs> yeah, you don't need a lot, Chad. You don't need a lot. Not things people like doing, but just a little and often will get you a long way. Yep, absolutely. Um, I don't think there's any other accessories we missed on that. Like you said, uh, if you want us to go through the MVM region another day, then that'll be great. Um, yeah, I think... I think we got a lot of interest in that. So if you're up for it, we'll definitely uh, plan that. Yeah, I think there's not a problem there. with that because we've got a lot of the accessories. Obviously, we've got Canvac dust extraction to talk about. Yeah. That's a big part of wood turning because it's the, the main thing that our people have problems with is the dust and things like that. We've got a lovely uh, range in Canvac with a new bayonet fitting and accessories that we've uh, that you stock for us, obviously. Um, yeah. We've got all the accessories and chucks and centers that we turn. The full range of turning tools with the uh, the sets as well, so all good. But no, it's been great. I'm glad there's been a, a lot of interest in uh, in today's. Yeah, no, we really appreciate it, and thanks for answering all the questions. Uh, mm -hmm. If anybody has a a question here in the U.S., reach out to us here at Turner's Warehouse. Uh, we do have Harold's in stock, so we can ship you one today. So if you need one, we got you. Um, otherwise, if you're in another country, just look for your local dealer. Uh, visit your dealer because it's a great thing to see them in person and talk to somebody who turns on them. And uh, if you're in the UK, maybe you can even run into these guys at events sometimes. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, but we really appreciate it, Craig. If you had anything else you wanted to to mention. No, that's, that's fine. That's great. It's been a pleasure to uh, have you host it, Chad. Really appreciate your help because it's nice to get it across to other people. Obviously, you've got all the experience in the world yourself and it just helps that you're asking me the questions you probably they said don't ask a question you don't know the answer to. I've got a feeling you knew most of the answers, but uh, it's just <laughs> nice to see it. It's just nice to see it in place. And yeah, uh, and like I say, if 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 you get any emails through, uh, we're more than happy to help you with that. And um, hopefully, hopefully yeah. uh, we'll get a few more people joining us with the wood turning on the Herald. Absolutely. And and someone just commented that Records YouTube channel is an excellent source of information. So uh, there are a lot of great videos. I watch a lot of those myself just to like freshen up on details. And I think, Craig, you do most of those or a lot of them at least. So yeah, we're trying uh, to spread them about. But we've, we like I said, we're just yeah. doing one at the moment on a bandsaw and we've got the Newark show in Nottingham uh, coming up uh, the beginning of March. As well. And then obviously you've got your events, which are I try and watch as much as I can. I love the uh, the ring one that you do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, and obviously you do a lot with the pens. The designs of pens are incredible. But I think yeah. for that type of work, Chad, I think this machine uh, sort of lends itself to it, doesn't it? Yeah. the The Herald is a great small item lathe for like pens and handles, but it also can handle a nice size bowl. So it's really good that you get both sides of it, and you know. The last few years, all the prices of machines have moved up, and the Herald is a, a great price at nine ninety nine that you really can't compete with. Because a lot of people, when they're starting, want to you know spend less, which I understand, but then they regret buying a lesser machine. So it's a it's a it's a great starter lathe that somebody can use for a long, long time because it's not really a starter lathe. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thanks everybody for joining us. It's been a Thank pleasure. Thank you, Craig. We appreciate it. Uh, we'll let you go here. 
Uh, if yeah. anyone has any other questions, please let us know at Turner's Warehouse. If you are new to the channel, go ahead and subscribe so you can catch our live streams. We do live streams on a regular basis. Uh, most of the time we're turning or making something, uh, but occasionally we do have stuff like this. So it's really good information. So if you have any questions, reach out to us uh, and we will talk to you next time. Thanks for watching, everybody. Give us a thumbs up if you like this so we know if it's uh, something we should do again. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes.